This video is all about formation of planetary systems. That's topic 12 of the GCSE in Astronomy by Edexcel. Okay, so let's look at the specification as we always do to see what we're covering. Doesn't look like there's so much in this one, but there is some detail we need to go into. So let us just get cracking straight away with this particular one. We're starting with gravity, that mysterious force that causes things to fall, or so it seems on Earth, a uh, force that draws things towards the center of the planet. Um, there are some issues with gravity. It, it actually is one of the uh, forces that people often get confused with. There's a lot of misconceptions surrounding it. The acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per square second on the surface of the Earth. Um, pretty much that's what it is. Um, but that means that all bodies will accelerate on the surface of the Earth initially in free fall at that rate. Of course, if you were to go further away from the center of the Earth, that amount would drop. But importantly, that means that two masses that are different, two bodies with different masses, uh, would experience different gravitational forces, but would still accelerate at the same rate towards the Earth. That's what this little animation here is uh, supposed to be showing, where a ball drops down. Um, now, how good that is, but that's what it is. Um, now... <sighs> Because everything falls downwards, there's a misconception, a very easy misconception to have, that somehow the world is flat and everything gets pulled down. But that's not true. People forget that the Earth is itself a body that interacts with bodies that are falling. As gravity isn't a standalone force that just acts on things to pull them towards the Earth. All forces come in pairs. That's Newton's third law. So the gravitational force between a body, say this ball that this person is dropping, and the Earth, that gravitational force pulling the ball towards the Earth is paired with exactly the same magnitude force on the Earth, which is also a gravitational force pulling it towards that ball. The two are going to experience the same magnitude force towards each other, the Earth and the ball. The reason why the ball accelerates with such a high acceleration compared to the Earth is because although the force is the same, but the force that the ball experiences and the force that the Earth experiences, the Earth's mass is many, many orders of magnitude greater. So the Earth's acceleration is much, much smaller. So a bit of a weird force to get your head around what's going on there. Um, so you have to kind of remember that the Earth itself and the body that's falling towards it are going to accelerate. Now, the Earth's acceleration is going to be so small, we're not going to notice it, but it is there. And that's going to be important later on when we look at the effect of the gravitational force between bodies that are more comparable in size. For example, maybe two stars or a planet orbiting close to a star, that sort of thing. You can see there's a grey outline indicating where these two bodies initially were, and the only force that's acting on these two bodies is the gravitational force, and they are accelerating towards each other. The arrows should still be there, but for the simplicity of the animation, the arrows have been removed. Uh, but they are accelerating towards each other. So the force that the smaller body feels towards the big body is the same as the force the big body feels towards the small body. And yet, on the surface of the Earth, everything accelerates downwards at the same rate. So you put those two ideas together, you can see the reason why there'd be a misconception. Well, hang on a minute. These two bodies have different accelerations, and yet it's gravity causing that acceleration. And yet here you're telling me all bodies have the same acceleration. Well, yes, but that's because the acceleration is going to be equal to the gravitational field strength. The gravitational field strength of the surface of the Earth due to the Earth is about 9.81 meters per square second. The acceleration due to gravity, or should I say the gravitational field strength, at the centre of the Earth towards the mass of the ball that we were considering earlier, the ball's got very little mass, so it has a very small gravitational field strength, and so there's much smaller acceleration for the Earth towards the ball. So the physics does check out, but it's really difficult to reconcile these two ideas. The idea of the same acceleration for all bodies 
accelerating towards the Earth, and yet different mass bodies accelerate towards each other differently when they have the same gravitational force. So how are you going to reconcile these two ideas? I'm afraid it's just a matter of committing this to memory. The idea that all bodies experience the same acceleration towards the Earth, just remember that, and that the gravitational forces are always paired, due to Newton's third law, with forces on another body which has the same magnitude in the opposite direction. Uh, I made a little note here. Young children learn nonsense phrases. Don't say nonsense like that. I mean, that's it's for a start, it's just not true. And secondly, it causes more misconceptions than it solves. So any parents or teachers out there, don't teach what comes up, come what must I can't even say it. What comes up must come down. It's going to cause more problems than it than it solves. Okay, so the problem is made worse by resources you can find out there to learn about gravity. This is an image I took from Wikipedia. This is a genuine image. You can look it up on Wikipedia about gravity. And here we have the Earth with a little arrow and the Sun with a big arrow. Well, what on Earth are those arrows supposed to represent? Well, it's not force, because the force of the Sun on the Earth is the same as the force of the Earth on the Sun. Those two arrows should be equal magnitude. Well, maybe the arrows are representing acceleration. Well, in that case, they're the wrong way around. The Earth's arrow should be longer than the Sun's arrow. So everything about this image is wrong. And you're going to find all sorts of nonsense. I mean, and the Earth is nowhere near that big compared to the Sun. And they're nowhere near this close together. There's all sorts of problems with this picture. So that doesn't help. So there are different models for the gravitational force. And one of the most common ones is Newton's law of universal gravitation, what we can call classical gravity which is explained or described by this equation here. The gravitational force between two masses is proportional to the product of those two masses. That means that the two masses times together and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between those two masses. And so that's what the divided by r square means. And this is just what it says here in, in roughly in words. So if you increase one of the masses, you get a bigger gravitational force. If you increase the other mass, you get a bigger gravitational force. If you double one of the masses, you get double the gravitational force. If you double the other mass, you get double the gravitational force. You double both masses, you get four times the gravitational force. But remember, when we talk about the gravitational force, we are talking about the force on one body due to another and on the other body due to the first. It's the same magnitude force. That is what this F means. And r is just the radial distance between them, the distance between the centers of those masses. So um, are there any sort of better models for the gravitational force? <clears throat> well, there are. And we will have a look at those in a later video when I finally get around to recording it. Topic 16, cosmology, includes details about those other models of gravity. The fact is that gravity is not understood at this stage by physicists. We have really good classical models of gravity. We also have some very effective uh, relativistic models of gravity. But they can't be used to describe very small bodies. Or if they can be used to describe very small bodies, we have no evidence that these models work. We have no evidence that Newton's law of gravitation works for very small bodies. But we know for a fact it doesn't work for big bodies or bodies that are far apart. So these better models of gravity we have, um, they are improvements, but they're not the end of the journey. We have not yet come up with the perfect model of gravity. We're working on it, but we're not there yet. Um, so there's something to be aware of, that's all I'm saying. General relativity explains gravity quite well, but it kind of breaks down when it comes to black holes at a certain extent, because black hole singularities are points uh, with zero volume. Volumes approaching zero, let's, let's say that. So, so we know the model of gravity that we, we currently use to make uh, cosmological predictions is still flawed. It's still broken. And the current models we've got for gravity have the idea of dark energy, which somehow 
counteracts gravity to make the universe expand at a greater and greater rate, the expansion of the universe accelerating. And again, we'll cover that in topic 16. Our models of gravity, our cosmological model of gravity, also includes something called dark matter. And we know that there must be this dark matter because otherwise galaxies couldn't hold themselves together. They would just fly apart because of how quickly they are rotating. And we've got very good measurements of how much dark matter there is and where the dark matter should be. But we don't know the nature of this dark matter yet. So, th again, this is a, a good model of gravity we've got, but we haven't unraveled all the mysteries of it just yet. We're working on it, as all physicists should be. Um, so it, this is, I think, an important point. Everyone knows about gravity, but actually, at the very fundamental essence of gravity, we still are not sure. So what do we know? Well, what can we use gravity for? Well, we're going to talk about orbits. That's, for us, in the topic of planetary physics, what gravity um, uh, gives us is circular motion, is, is or even elliptical motion, is orbits of bodies. So here on the top right, and I might even see if I can zoom in on this little picture, because it's a good one. Let's, uh, oh, yes, zoom in on that little picture there. Here on the right here, you can see that we've got a schematic, a picture of the Earth, and imagine we stick a cannon on the top of it. I forget whether this is Galileo or Newton that came up with this idea. Someone can tell me in the comments after they look it up. Uh, but if we imagine this cannon shooting a cannonball, we would expect it to follow a curved path and to hit the Earth. But the Earth is curved. So if I shoot the cannonball fast enough, then it follows a curved path, but because the Earth is also curved, we can follow a curved path for, so the cannonball never gets any closer to the Earth. That's path C on this diagram. Shoot it a bit faster, it'll move away from the Earth, but gravity is always pulling it towards the Earth, so eventually it will fall back towards the Earth. And we've got our elliptical orbit D. If we shoot it fast enough, then it can actually leave the Earth altogether. Um, that's E. And we'll talk about those various cases a little bit later. So circular motion. Here I've got uh, another animation. If I zoom in, the animation stops, so I won't. It's showing the same thing as the picture above. Uh, but the picture right at the bottom here is the interesting one. You can see there is an arrow pointing in the direction that the green body is moving. That arrow simply represents the velocity vector of the body. There is no force pushing the green body forwards. It moves forwards because it was moving forwards before, and there's no reason for it to stop moving forwards. Its kinetic energy doesn't change. Its energy store that's associated with its motion is not changing, because the force acting on this green body is perpendicular to the direction the body is moving. So because of that, no work is being done. So the kinetic energy of the green body isn't changing. Hence, it's not going faster, it's not going slower. But the force acting perpendicular is going to cause acceleration. So the body will accelerate. Now, remember, acceleration is a rate of change of velocity, not speed. So the speed of the green body isn't changing, but its velocity is because its direction is changing. And so the green body will accelerate towards the centre of the Earth but never get any closer if it happens to be travelling at the right speed, at orbital speed. The picture at the bottom here shows that actually it's not quite as simple as that. For a big mass like the Earth being orbited by a small mass like a satellite, we can consider the centre of the Earth as being the point around which the satellite is orbiting. But actually, both the satellite and the Earth are orbiting a common point between the two, what we call the barycenter, the centre of mass of the system, which is right here for a system where the body that's orbiting is more significant or has a more significant mass compared to the body that is being orbited. So we talked about Kepler's laws and and why you always have elliptical orbits back in Topic 8. So I won't go into that again. Look back at that Topic 8 video if you want to have a look at that. Uh, but this is going to be a useful phenomenon, the fact that the body being orbited also orbits. That's going to be a useful phenomenon when it comes to detecting planets later on in this video. The other thing that gravity does for us, it doesn't just cause 
um, or orbital motion. It also causes tides. Now, tides is or tides are one of those topics that gets incorrectly explained by many, many, many videos. And so I'm going to do my best here to do a better job. But there are some really good videos out there. And so or may, I might have to report, record a better perfect, perfect video about tides. But this is a bit of a waffly video to explain to you. The easiest way to visualize what's happening with tides is to place ourselves in a reference frame where the Earth is not moving. OK, I know the Earth is moving and I know the Earth is accelerating towards the um, towards the sun. I also know that the moon is orbiting and the moon is accelerating towards the earth and therefore there will be a component of acceleration of the earth towards the moon. So let's just look at the earth and the moon and forget the sun for a second. The sun does have an effect and it's similar to the moon's effect but because the sun's so much further away it's so much smaller the effect we're going to ignore it for now um, and just bear in mind that the sun does the same thing. So we've got the Earth, we've got the moon, and the moon is orbiting the Earth. But remember, that means the Earth is also orbiting the moon. The Earth, uh, moon is accelerating towards the Earth, and that's why the moon goes in a circle. But let's go back a few slides. Remember that if the Earth is accelerating to, sorry, the moon is accelerating towards the Earth, then that means the Earth is also accelerating towards the moon. Okay, you remember this animation. So all of this is happening. The Earth is accelerating towards the moon. But let's imagine that we sit ourselves on the Earth and ignore sort of the effect of the moon. We're just sat on the Earth as though the Earth is stationary. It's, forget the fact it's shaking around like this because of the moon. So when we sit on the Earth, what do we see? Well, we see that there is uh, the, the moon is over here on the right in this diagram. So a point over here on the right that's closer is going to experience a greater acceleration towards that um, the moon. The reason why it's going to experience a greater acceleration towards the moon is because it's closer. Any mass on this surface of the Earth over here is closer to the moon. Therefore, the gravitational force will be a little bit greater. Therefore, the acceleration will be a little bit greater. Don't forget the Earth itself is accelerating. And we're going to pretend it's not. So we're going to subtract that acceleration from every other value of acceleration we've got. And any body over here is also accelerating towards the moon. That means to the right. But don't forget we are going to subtract the acceleration of the Earth because we want to see what the acceleration of the mass on the surface of the Earth is towards the Moon um, from the Earth's reference frame. So we're going to consider the Earth not to be accelerating. Essentially, what this means is if we subtract the acceleration of the Earth, we are getting some sort of pseudo-acceleration uh, in, on the left-hand side over here, the acceleration to the right is smaller than the acceleration to the right of the entire Earth because we can consider that acting from the centre of the Earth. And so when you subtract a bigger rightward number from a, small, a smaller rightward number, you end up with a leftward number. <laughs> Thinking about it in terms of vectors. Acceleration is a vector. So big right-hand acceleration here smaller right-hand acceleration here. This acceleration, subtract this acceleration, is therefore going to give you an acceleration to the left. The water, or any mass, on the surface of the Earth here is not actually accelerating left. But considering the Earth as being completely stationary and not accelerating produces this pseudo-force and therefore a pseudo-acceleration away from the Earth. Now, that's not very interesting. That effect is very, very small, really. What's interesting is what happens up here. And so I've zoomed in on this left-hand top corner here to have a look what happens. Remember, the Earth's acceleration was to the right, from the center of the Earth to the right. The entire blue ball here is accelerating to the right. So I've represented that with a red arrow pointing to the right, labeled AE, the acceleration of the Earth. The water is acceleration towards the moon. And so the moon, any water on the surface here, acceleration towards the moon, is going to be at an angle towards the moon, because the moon is going to be along this line of action and the water is vertically displaced from that line of action. And remember what we're doing is the acceleration of the water 
towards the moon, subtract the acceleration of the Earth towards the moon, will give us the pseudo-acceleration, the effective acceleration of the water relative to the Earth. So how do you subtract vectors? Well, it's the same as adding vectors where one of them has been reversed in direction. So we're going to do AW, the acceleration of the water, subtract the acceleration of the Earth so that we are looking from that Earth's rest reference frame, which means drawing an, a vector arrow which is to the right but changing its direction so it's to the left, the same length, and you end up with da -da -da -da, this black arrow here. And if you do that at every single point on the Earth's surface, you end up with an acceleration vector for each point on the surface following the sort of pattern you see here. Now, what that means is any water over here on the top left will be accelerated downwards. Any, ex any from the uh, bottom left will be accelerated upwards. And so on this left-hand side, all the water is accelerating towards this left-hand side here. If we look on the right-hand side, the opposite is true. This water is accelerated down and right. This water is accelerated up and right. And so the overall acceleration of the water is towards this bulge here. So you end up with water being accelerated and therefore pushed up towards this bulge here and this bulge here. Now, remember, this doesn't... Okay, we're looking at pseudo-forces. What's actually happening is the Earth is being pulled in towards the, uh, the moon and the water is being pulled in towards the moon at a lesser amount over this side and a greater amount over this side. But if we just look from the Earth's perspective, as though the Earth is stationary and not accelerating, I know it is, but let's pretend we're in the Earth's reference frame. So we subtract the Earth's acceleration. We see the reason why there are two tides a day. Okay, the moon orbits the Earth round and round and round, but the Earth rotates. The moon takes a month, uh, nearly a month to go around the Earth, but the Earth rotates. So as the Earth rotates underneath this, this satellite, as the Earth rotates, that uh, pseudo force, that pseudo acceleration on the water caused by a pseudo force due to us looking at the Earth as a stationary reference frame, that causes the water to be pushed up towards these two bulges. And as the Earth rotates around, those bulges are going to be pushed around. And so you end up with two tides a day one this side, one this side, because it takes one day to rotate through both. Wow. So that was a long way of me trying to explain tides, and I'm not sure how clear I made it. But as I say, there are actually better videos out there for that. But be aware of several incorrect explanations. Incorrect explanations include the fact that the Earth is rotating, which pushes the water out, some sort of centrifugal effect. I'm sure you could probably find some clever way of explaining it that way, but that's going to cause more misconceptions than it solves. A uh, second misconception would be that it's the force pulling the Earth towards the satellite along this line, um, which does happen, by the way, which is greater nearer the satellite and weaker further away, and that causes the bulges. I mean, again, that will happen, but it's a very small effect. What's interesting, the reason for tides is not that effect along that line. That's too small an effect. It's what's going on for the water uh, away from that line of action between the centre of the Earth and the centre of the Moon. That water around the top here and around the bottom here being pulled towards these two sides. I should also point out, this is us looking at the Earth from above the North Pole. So when I'm saying top, bottom, left, right, um, I'm not really talking about the top of the Earth as in the North Pole. I'm just talking about this side of the Earth, this side of the Earth. And the Earth rotates in this direction around because of us looking from above the North Pole. So that is complicated, but that is how tides work. So what can tides do? Well, okay, yeah, they can cause um, water to bulge up, which is useful for us. Wouldn't be life on Earth, we don't think, if it wasn't for tides, causing salt water to fill certain pools, and then those pools, the water evaporates, leaving certain minerals that can do chemistry. I'm not, I don't know. I don't know about abiogenesis. But anyway, that's uh, one of the things we think tides do for us. Other things, well, tides, any sort of gravitational force, really, but tidal forces can become quite significant. Because there is going to be that tidal force causing bulging of water, um, 
you can see that there'd be a bulge. Well, what if the body itself was semi-liquid? Well, in that case, the body itself will change shape as well. And when you change the shape of a body, you can cause internal heating due to the internal friction within the body. Things are moving past each other as they change shape, and that's going to cause internal heating. And we know this happens for some moons of Jupiter, heating them up enough that they're, and Saturn, heating them enough, enough that there's liquid water under the surface, under the frozen water surface of these moons. Uh, but also we get things like uh, ring systems where the tidal forces can be so great it will actually break apart uh, a small moon or a small planetoid into smaller parts and they can form ring systems. Uh, this is I'm circling this saying ring system, that's an asteroid belt. But I suppose an asteroid belt is similar to a ring system but for a star rather than for a planet. Um, is much sparser than a ring system for a planet, but then it's farther away from the star than the rings are around a planet. So that's probably the reason why that would happen. Incidentally, the moon will not form a ring system. The moon will not get close enough to the Earth to break apart into small um, into small pieces because the moon's actually drifting farther and farther from the Earth over time. Whereas uh, one of Mars's moons, I can't remember which one, but remember you can look it up, that is drifting towards Mars and that will eventually um, break up into a ring system. So what other, what other things do gravity, what does gravity do? Well, this is um, a lovely little animation of what I suppose is called the Great Attractor. We can get these lovely uh, regular orbital patterns, uh, but small changes, just tiny changes in the position or I should say in the acceleration of a body, can cause it to follow a wildly different path. So if you follow this little black dot, it looks like it's quite happy orbiting around one of these masses. Maybe it's a black hole or something. And then there's another black hole nearby. And the tiniest difference in position can cause it to follow a completely different path. Um, look up Lorentz attractors if you're interested in that sort of thing. It's a rather extreme example of this. It appears to be chaotic, unpredictable when it's going to change direction and uh, to join the other path it's it's chaos just means it's difficult to predict because there's too many variables it still follows it's not random it still follows the usual rules of physics the usual laws of physics all chaos means is that the outcome is incredibly sensitive to any initial conditions so <clears throat> This means that with a nice stable solar system like ours, you get a star moving close enough to the out to our star, it can cause just a little bit of a tug on some of those bodies orbiting near the edge of our solar system, and their orbits can wildly change because of that. They can do things like knock comets in towards the sun, um, just because of those little tugs. So um a little bit of terminology here. This is something that you are supposed to know for your GCSE, the Grand Tack Hypothesis. And tack, when you're sailing, when you're on a boat, a tack is a change in direction. So the Grand Tack Hypothesis is the idea that uh, the that Jupiter's orbit changed significantly. It changed from going in a nice ring around the sun at about three and a half astronomical units away from the sun that uh, gravitational force caused it to be attracted towards the sun and it drifted inwards until it was about one and a half astronomical units. And just try and visualize how close to the sun that is. You know, Earth is only one astronomical unit away from the sun. Um, but then Jupiter then drifted outwards from being near to the sun uh, to be about 5.2 astronomical units away from the sun. Remember, again, Earth approximately one astronomical unit away from the sun. So what what does this mean? Why would uh, Jupiter move its position? And it's the same reason why if you take a musical instrument and you have two strings that are quite similar in, um, well, no, have to be quite similar. You get two strings on your instrument. You can cause them to vibrate sympathetically. Uh, take, for example, a piano. If I carefully hold down the middle C without allowing the note to sound, and then I strike a C an octave lower, and then just remove my hand again, the string, or the strings, 
for the middle C will start to vibrate sympathetically. There's vibration that causes sympathetic vibration of those strings. So the idea of the grand uh, attack hypothesis, the idea that these planets can move, is that they move into a place where those gravitational tugs from the neighbouring planets cause a resonance. They each tug each other with a rhythm, with a frequency that causes the uh, planetary arrangement, the distance between the planets and the sun, to have a nice regular pattern to it. Um, <clears throat> It's there's evidence for this. So evidence for this is the idea of orbital resonance. The fact that there are integer fractions for the frequency, or should I say the time periods of orbit of the planets. Very nice, easy numbers to work with. Um, then we've got the idea that there are asteroids with all sorts of inclinations and eccentricities in the asteroid belt. Why would that happen? Well, if the asteroid belt was formed when the solar system formed, you'd expect it to be like a, you know, one of Saturn's rings. A uh, nice flat disk, regularly spaced out, everything orbiting the same way because of conservation of angular momentum. You take something like Jupiter and drift it through the asteroid belt a few times, just stirring that up, which causes all these asteroids to become scattered and have all sorts of different orbital paths. So here's a little bit about orbital resonance. Uh, if you have a look, uh, you can see that at certain times, all three of these uh, moons and Jupiter will line up. And the ratio for these orbits are nice easy numbers. 4 to 1, 2 to 1, 1 to 1. So Io, for every one orbit that Io does, Europa does two full orbits. For every one orbit that Io does, Ganymede does four full orbits. Well, that sounds like a hell of a coincidence. Well, it's not. It's because when they become close to each other, these moons, they tug each other. So when a moon is made to go faster, that's going to pull it out a little bit. And so it will settle. These moons will settle in orbits where they have these tugs forward and backwards that cause those frequencies to stay roughly the same. I refer to it as these little gravitational tugs. Orbital resonances, we see these in a few places. Yes, we see them with moons around planets. We do also see it with planets around stars. And we see it in other places in the in the galaxy as well, where we look at exoplanets. Uh, Saturn's rings, here they are, beautiful Saturn's rings. And we think that you know the gravitational force causing these rings to stay in a nice, easy, a very thin band is provided by these shepherding moonlets, these little moonlets that orbit around within the rings or um, in the plane of the rings and just keep pushing together or, or, or giving those, those rings a little tug to keep them all together so that they don't all just drift apart and collide with each other. And there are some really beautiful um, dynamics that happens within the rings of Saturn. There are moonlets that switch places and all sorts of things. Moonlets just mean small moons. And these are shepherding moonlets because they just help keep the rings together because of those gravitational tugs. Now, one of the hardest topics to get our head around are what we call Lagrangian points. Uh, there are five of these Lagrangian points. Some of them are easy to understand and some of them take a bit more brain power. They're quite tricky to get your head around. So Lagrangian points that are easy to understand. Well, first of all, what are they? Well, they're points of equilibrium. Uh, equilibrium of what? Well, equilibrium of acceleration, I guess, so that their body placed at one of those points will not accelerate. A body placed exactly at L4, L1, L2, L5, or L3 will not accelerate relative to the bodies that are being orbited. So Lagrangian points are found around bodies, and there has to be a ratio of masses, bodies where one of the masses is around about 25 times more massive than the other or more. So the Sun and the Earth, they satisfy that criteria. Jupiter and the Sun, they satisfy that criteria. Um, Earth and the Moon satisfies that criteria. 
I think. So here is the uh, the sun. Here, I think the Earth and the Moon. I'm starting to doubt myself now. I'll have to check that. Anyway, here is the Sun. Here is the Earth. And so I could place a body exactly at L1 between the Earth and the Sun, and its acceleration will be zero. Now, what do I mean by that? Because obviously its acceleration can't be zero because it's going to have to move in a circle to stay exactly between the Earth and the Sun. And if it's moving in a circle, then it must be accelerating because its velocity is changing. So when I talk about acceleration being zero, I mean relative to this three-body system of the body I place at L1, the Sun, and the Earth in this example. So again, like we did with the tides, we're imagining that nothing is moving. I know it is. I know the Earth is orbiting around the Sun. But let's position ourselves some point above the Earth and the Sun so that we are turning at the same rate that the Earth is going around the Sun. You know, we turn once every year and this Earth goes around the Sun once every year. So from our perspective, the Earth and the Sun just stay there. We are in an accelerated reference frame. And from an accelerated reference frame, yeah, we're going to get an acceleration towards the center of the sun of any body placed at L1. But because we're accelerating as well, when we observe all this, we don't see that. We're subtracting that acceleration from any measurement of acceleration we take. So at L1, when we say there's no acceleration towards the sun or the earth, we do just mean there's no acceleration relative to the reference frame, which itself is actually accelerating. Difficult stuff. So, um, yes, L1 is, I think, quite an easy one to visualize because if you're attracted towards the sun with the same force you're attracted towards the earth and you place a body there, it's just going to sit there. So the resultant force would be zero. So the resultant acceleration would be zero. It's just going to sit there. However, if I give it a bit of a nudge, I knock, knock that body slightly closer to the sun, it's going to fall towards the sun. And if I knock that body slightly closer towards the earth, it's going to fall towards the earth. Because if the body is closer to the sun, earth's gravity becomes weaker, sun's gravity becomes stronger, so the body's going to fall towards the sun, and vice versa for the earth. Interestingly, if I place the body somewhere up here, as the red arrow indicates, we'll actually fall towards that Lagrangian point because we're attracted towards the Earth and towards the Sun, so we get pulled down towards that Lagrangian point. So it's a sort of a pseudo-stability. It's uh, stable in the vertical direction, but it's not stable in the horizontal direction. That's L1. L1's easy to visualize. L2 and L3 is the same sort of physics, and that's not too bad to visualize either. So at L2, we've been attracted towards the Earth and we're being attracted towards the Sun with the same force. And you might say, well, why would that not cause this body to just fall towards the Sun and the Earth? Well, it does. But don't forget, we're orbiting. So because we're orbiting, we want a force towards the Earth and the Sun to go in a circle around the Earth and the Sun. We want that force. So how are we going to cope with visualizing this if we're in an accelerated reference frame? Well, that's the good thing about being in an accelerated reference frame, is that we can look at pseudo forces, centrifugal forces acting outwards. And before people start screaming in the comments saying there are no centrifugal forces, there are, but there are fictitious forces that are only measurable if you are in an accelerated reference frame. They are fictitious forces. But that doesn't mean you can't measure them. Take, for example, a, a car driving around a roundabout. If I were to go to a popular restaurant and buy myself a double vegan burger and large chips and a large Sprite from the drive through of that popular restaurant and place it on the dashboard of my car, then start driving around a roundabout, I expect my drink is going to fly towards the left of my vehicle. Initially, relative to the vehicle, my drink was not moving. But then my drink started to move towards the left. Well, that looks a lot like an acceleration to me. F equals ma, that means there must be a resultant force on my drink pulling it to the left of my vehicle because I'm driving on the left because I live in the UK. If you live somewhere else and you drive on the right, just reverse all these directions. So I'm driving around my roundabout, so I'm steering to the right and my 
from the point of view of my car, I can see the drink fall to the left. If I get a Newton meter, strap it onto my drink, I can measure that force. I know there's a force there. I can measure it. Actually, what you're measuring is the force that would be pulling inwards on the drink to make it go in a circle. And that's not going to be enough to, to keep it going in a circle, which is why the drink tries to go in a straight or well, a curve, but more straight path and causes it to, relative to the vehicle, to fly to the left of the car and splash all my left window in Sprite. Sprite zero, because it contains no sugar. Well, it does contain sugar, but not glucose. I'll not get into that. Right, so the um, as you're going around a roundabout, you're steering hard, there is a pseudo force that you can measure if you're in the car. If you're outside the car, then you can just see the sprites trying to go in a straight line. And the car is the thing that's moving. So back to this picture, we're stood somewhere above the solar system and we are rotating as well. Just like when we're in the car, the car is rotating. And so we can see there's an outward force on this satellite placed at L2. Just like I can see an outward force on my sprite when I'm in the car. Oh, other fizzy drinks are available. Right, so, uh, so that outward force, a centrifugal force, balances the gravitational force inwards so that, relative to my accelerated reference frame, a satellite placed at L2 will experience no resultant force. Actually, there is a resultant force. The magnitude of that is the same as the magnitude of the centrifugal force I measured before. Actually, that is the centripetal force, which is actually pulling the satellite at L2 in a circle so it stays in the same position relative to the Earth and the Sun. But we're simplifying it. Otherwise, we're never going to understand L5 and L4. L3 is the same idea as L2. You've got a gravitational force but towards the sun, towards the earth, and there's a centrifugal force outwards, which is keeping us in that position. So the resultant force is zero. Again, actually, centrifugal force isn't there. Actually, we need a resultant force inwards so that we have our circular motion. But for simplicity, let's imagine that we are in the reference frame. Therefore, there are centrifugal forces. Now, what that means is at L4 and L5, there are outward forces. There are also inward forces. And so any body placed at L4 or L5 will be stable. But what's really interesting about L4 or L5 is if you place a body displaced from it, it will orbit L4 or L5. It will actually orbit around those Lagrangian points. Because when your body gets closer to the earth and the sun when it gets closer to them that's going to cause the gravitational force to accelerate it goes faster which means it gets flung outwards which means it goes slowed down again so it actually orbits in this direction as it gets closer it goes faster and then it goes farther out and then it goes farther in and so on so any body placed around l4 and l5 lagrangian points is going to orbit around that area in a sort of semi-stable state um there's a lovely statement down here about angular momentum induced speed increases and you can look at it in terms of angular momentum but i think that gets a little bit more complicated than it needs to be but you can read that if you want it's a lovely bit of extra reading about how lagrangian points really work far easier to just visualize them from that accelerating reference frame where the earth and the sun appears to be stationary Okay, so here's another little video showing uh, Lagrangian points. And there's an animation at the top trying to show that when two bodies move towards each other, because of conservation of angular momentum, they will appear to speed up. The period of rotation reduces. And then as they move apart, they appear to slow down. And you can use that sort of physics to explain why when you move towards the sun and the earth, you speed up. And then when you move farther away, you slow down. You can use the same sort of physics here. Uh, what is it that causes the uh, bodies to speed up? It's complicated. So have a look at circular motion and conservation of angular momentum if you want to. But I could spend an hour talking about that. And I've already been talking for 45 minutes. I've got some editing to do as well. 50 minutes. I've got some editing to do as well. So I'm not going to talk about that now. Otherwise, the video will end up far too long. So... Lagrangians. We can stop for a second. Let's move on from there. That's a gravitational effect. Oh, I didn't mention the satellites. 
should have mentioned the satellites. What it means is that you're going to get around the Earth and say the Earth is here and the Sun is here. You're going to get a bunch of asteroids that get almost captured and rotate or uh, orbit around get the right way around orbit around l4 and orbit around l5 uh, we call them trojan asteroids and you can see loads of them from jupiter and the sun loads of asteroids stuck at l4 and l5 for jupiter and it's a good thing they are otherwise there'd be more asteroids that could smack into the earth and wipe out all life Right, so other changes. That's gravitational changes. What else can happen? Well, there are collisions. From time to time, some of those asteroids do smack into planets. From time to time, small planetoids will strike larger planetoids. And what happens in those cases? Well, if it's a small enough collision, you can get craters forming. We've seen them on the surface of the Moon, Mars, and so on, even Earth. But um, you can also cause significant changes, if the collisions have enough energy, significant changes to the motion of planets. And this, we've got this lovely picture here of Uranus, whose axis of rotation is almost perpendicular to the, um, to the how do I describe it? The Almost perpendicular to all the other um, rotational axes. It's almost parallel to the plane that Uranus orbits the Sun. And so how does that happen? Well, we think it's a very massive collision that caused that to happen, to tilt the axis of rotation of Uranus all the way around. And Venus, very, very slow rotation indeed, and it's actually back to front. It's rotating the other way around compared to all the other planets. And we think that was a big collision as well. And the Earth's axis, giving us seasons, Another thing that might have been necessary for life to develop, we think that the Earth's axis being tilted by about 23 degrees was also caused by a large collision, we think. Um, <clears throat> what about the sun? What does the sun do? The sun causes, again, a few effects. One of them is solar wind. And so if you see this lovely animation here, you can see there is a... Um, a body here. This is a comet and it is emitting um, volatile materials off the surface. Volatile materials, things like water, water ice, which will uh, sublimate, just turn directly into a gas when it has enough energy, uh, when the molecules have enough energy. And so when it gets this uh, satellite gets hit with a bit of solar wind, you can see it produces these these tails. And when the solar wind uh, stops, we get a bit of a gap. The tail, um, the tail becomes much shorter, much less pronounced. So solar wind bombarding comets with particles from the sun causes enough energy for sublimation of material from the surface of those comets. And we see that as a tail. This is the typical structure of a comet, which I think I've talked about in an earlier video, so perhaps I won't talk about it too much. But the basic structure of the comet, you've got right down in the middle here your nucleus, and around it you've got your coma, and around that you've got your um, sort of region here. I don't know, I don't know what it's labelled as here. Uh, envelope of hydrogen. Oh yeah, hydrogen envelope around here. Uh, sort of like a very, very sparse atmosphere weakly gravitationally bound to this mass because it's not a very big mass so it's very weak um this this comet's moving in this direction here and the sun happens to be over here in this diagram and so the sun is bombarding this this comet with solar wind radiation from the sun and that is causing two tails the first tail this tail is mostly gas and uh, maybe a plasma uh, very low mass particles that are ejected off exactly in the opposite direction, blown away by that solar wind. And there's also dust that's released because comets aren't just ice. There's also a considerable amount of dust there. And that dust also is blown away from the sun. But because the dust has a bit more uh, momentum, it will follow a bit of a path like this instead. Um, it doesn't go straight out. It, it, it's got a bit of a lag behind it. So you end up with this tail going like this. So you can see here, you've got the sun somewhere down here producing radiation because you've got the gas tail directly in the opposite direction from the sun. And lagging behind it, you've got the dust tail because the extra mass of the dust. Here we've got a lovely diagram of what else solar wind can do. 
So solar wind does cause um, planetary atmospheres to be stripped away. It gives enough energy to molecules that they can escape the planet altogether. Uh, that's why Elon Musk's idea of producing an atmosphere on Mars, it might be doomed to failure, because if you bombard the Martian atmosphere with solar wind, then Martian atmosphere gets thinner. So uh, it's probably a, a, a dead end as far as I... Well, that's what I think, but I'm not the expert. Who who am I to say? Um, but we, that's why we think that Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, or very, very thin atmosphere, should I say. Why Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, maybe even a thinner atmosphere, if any. Why the Moon doesn't have an atmosphere. These things don't have magnetic fields around them protecting them. So, you know, why does the Earth have an atmosphere still? Why does Jupiter have such a significant atmosphere if the uh, if Mars and um, and Mercury doesn't? Well, it's because Earth is protected by a strong magnetic field which causes that solar wind to be directed, uh, deflected away from the Earth. And if the solar wind bits of it happen to be going in exactly the right direction, we can even deflect it into the poles of the Earth and we can cause uh, radiation belts of these particles. They get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, uh, much like we're trying to do on a much bigger scale with a tokamak design to trap a plasma um, in a smaller space, at a high enough temperature to make nuclear fusion work. That's not going to happen in the Van Allen belt. It's far lower energy. It's the same idea magnetic restriction of charged particles causing this lovely donut shape this torus in fact we get two of them there are two van allen belts around the earth so the particles are either safely stored there deflected away or directed into the north and south pole where the uh, ozone layer does get stripped away at the poles but no one lives there so it's less of a concern now the farthest reaches of the effect of the solar wind is the very edge of what we call the heliosphere. So I think I might have shown this before as well. Heliosphere is a sort of sphere of influence that the sun has. And this is a, uh, a diagram, but notice carefully the scale. It's a logarithmic scale. This diagram's a map with a logarithmic scale. So you've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune along this logarithmic scale. So you know they get farther and farther apart the further away from the sun and then we've got this region here is labeled termination shock now what's happening there is the gravitational force acting on that radiation that is leaving the sun is uh, causing the radiation to stop and uh, effectively collide with the radiation that's being emitted um, through that shock region so you end up with this chaotic area here where radiation has fallen away and started falling back and has collided with the radiation that's going the other way. This is a lovely picture I pulled off Wikipedia that shows the termination shock modelled by water pouring into a sink. This isn't my sink. And so the heliopause is the very edge of the influence of the heliosphere. And then we go into the region of space between stars, interstellar space. Uh, the Oort cloud is gravitationally bound to our sun, but it's very weakly bound. And this is where our long period comets come from, um, probably knocked there from small gravitational interactions with other bodies passing by, which remember I talked about those uh, chaotic situations where tiny little changes can add up to a big effect overall and we get big comets falling in towards the centre of our solar system. Now, I'm not going to attempt to roll my R as I was doing in school the other day when I tried to pronounce this. This is the Roche limit. Um, this is a uh, sort of theoretical limit to how close a satellite can get to a planet or a planet can get to a star before it breaks apart. So if, if you consider the pictures up here, you've got, let's say, a planet and here is a moon and the moon is happily orbiting this planet for millions of years, billions of years, and as it gets closer, it starts to become deformed. That's because the gravitational force acting on one side is stronger than the other. Those tidal forces changes, uh, cause a change in shape. Why does it bulge? Go back to when we talked about tides earlier. Now, when you get past this theoretical limit, you end up with the internal forces holding the 
uh, the satellite together being weaker than the tidal forces trying to pull the satellite into a long thin shape and that causes it to break apart and the parts that are nearest the middle are going to be going faster so they're going to actually start moving outwards the parts on the outside will start to move inwards until you get this lovely ring forming and as it says here we saw this breakup of a comet happening um, in 1992 when it was approaching Ju uh, Jupiter, which I, I, you know, there's a lovely picture here showing the, the debris of a broken up comet. Very, very nice. Okay. So we want to keep an atmosphere around the planet, around Earth, or we're going to get Mars. We're going to make an atmosphere around Mars. So here's the problem. In a container of gas, this is what this model on the left is trying to show here, there's a range of kinetic energies and therefore a range of speeds. So on the y-axis of the graph at the bottom is effectively the number of particles. So it's frequency, I think, but it's the number of particles. And on the x-axis there is essentially how fast the, par oops, how fast the particles are moving. Um, related to the kinetic energy of the particles. There's a range. Now, you may remember back when we talked about escape velocity of quite a few lessons ago. The escape velocity, if a body is moving away from a planet at a speed greater than the escape velocity, then that body will leave the planet. Well, that's not just the case for big bodies. That's also the case for individual molecules, like, for example, molecules in the atmosphere. If they are travelling away from a planet fast enough, they will leave the planet. And because there's a range of speeds that particles can have, there will always be particles that are travelling fast enough to be able to leave. Probably not very many of them, possibly not very many of them, but there could be a significant number of them. And over time, more and more particles will leave, which means there's fewer and fewer particles, I've called them molecules here, in the atmosphere. So the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So if the temperature of the atmosphere is higher, especially the temperature in the upper atmosphere is higher, then this curve is shifted to the right because everything's got a, a higher temperature, which means higher average kinetic energy of the molecules, which means higher average speed of the molecules, which means more of the molecules have the uh, velocity greater than the escape velocity and can escape. But if we have a greater mass of planets, then the gravitational force is stronger, so the escape velocity would be higher, and so we are less likely to uh, have those particles that are able to escape. So Jupiter, big mass, that's one of the reasons why it's kept hold of its atmosphere. Mars, small mass, hasn't kept hold of its atmosphere. Um, Earth, you know, not that big a mass, but it's got a magnetic field which helps it keep hold of its atmosphere. Uh, Earth, uh, sorry, the Moon, no, not very big mass at all, and no magnetic fields. There's no chance to keep holding of its atmosphere. But atmosphere will always leak into space, and Earth's atmosphere is leaking into space slowly over time. So, gas giants. There's a lovely animation here on the right showing the formation of gas giants. You have a region around the formation of stars, or the early formation of stars, uh, of dust and gas unless it's a very young, you know, right at the beginning of the universe star, in which case it's going to be mostly gas, mostly hydrogen. But in those regions, you're going to get slight variations in density. And where the density in those regions of dust and gas is slightly higher, you're going to get more gravitational force towards those regions. And that causes the uh, dust and gas to condense, is the wrong word, I think, to accrete is probably the right word, into small little planetoids. It starts off by forming uh, small little particles that contain more than one atom. Then they collide and stick together, and then they collide and stick together. Eventually, you've got asteroids that stick together to form planetoids that form planets and so on. Uh, it says here, often there's a layer of liquid metallic hydrogen as a, an outer core, which produces strong magnetic fields. This is true for gas giants. And that's one of the reasons why gas giants tend to keep their atmosphere for longer. It's because of that magnetic field deflecting uh, solar wind, which would otherwise strip away the atmosphere. So there's some interesting facts there. Um, why is it a very dense, maybe iron or rocky, silica-based rock core? It, well, that's because that's where it's 
more likely to accrete that hydrogen or other gases around because it's more dense around those metals. So you tend to get metal cores in the center of these gas giants. And of course, you know, if I take a ball of gas and, I, and, and I'm in space and there's nothing else around, and I take a lump of iron and put it next to it, it's going to fall into the middle. It's going to sink into the gas giant. So how do we find planets? Well, okay, the, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are really easy to see because you can see them with your own eyes. Earth is the easiest one, just look down. But um, Uranus and Neptune, much more tricky to see. We had to predict where they were based on gravitational interactions and the orbit of Saturn not quite being what was predicted. We predicted where there must be other mass, and then we looked and we found those planets. Well, that's all very well and good, but that's all around our sun. Exoplanets are planets that orbit other stars, and we can find them by a few different ways. And we're going to look at some of those ways now. One of those ways is called the transit method. Now, in the transit method, we can only do this if the planet crosses between us and the star that the planet is orbiting. So remember, this is a star, not the sun. This is a star in our galaxy, which um, is a bit further away. It's not our sun. Now, Usually, the light from the star is going to have a pretty constant brightness, perhaps. And then when the planet crosses between us and the star, there will be a small reduction of the intensity of light that we detect. A dip. And then it will go back up at the end. The time it takes to dip down indicates either the size of the planet or how fast the planet's moving, how long it's dipped down for indicates how long it's taken for the planet to cross uh, across the the, uh, the disk of the star. And so we would get regular light curve dips like this if the planet is regularly orbiting the star. There'd be a pattern, a periodicity, which would tell us um, how long the year is for that planet. And if we know how long the year is, we can use Kepler's third year, uh, law to figure out um, how far away from the star that planet is, or should I say the exoplanet is. And if we know how far away it is, um, and we, we can work out how long it should take to go around. And that means we could tell how long it should take to go across this disk. And so we can use this to approximate how big the planet is, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of physics we can do with this data. This is what the data can look like. It's a lot more complicated than the first graph. So this is the signal, the raw signal. And you'll notice there's a significant amount of noise on it. In fact, let me zoom in on this signal, uh, just so you can see it a bit clearer. There's a significant amount of noise. The data is spread around quite a lot. And look at the numbers. It's a very, very small variation in brightness. It's labeled as relative brightness here because we're trying to show uh, relative to the normal brightness of that star of one. That's not related to um, not related to apparent brightness and absolute magnitude and things like that, which we'll talk about later. So what can you see? We take a data point um, regularly for the brightness of the star. Every now and then we go, and the brightness dips right down. And there's a pattern to it. Now, it's very hard to see the pattern. But what you can do is develop sophisticated computer programs that can take this data and identify a regular period. It does what's called a Fourier analysis on this data to identify um, certain frequencies that are present within this data. And so this one's purple, red, yellow, green, and so on. These are uh, different planets that cause the light to be blocked out. Certain planets. I do think it's interesting sometimes we get this peak, and I'm not sure whether that's reflection from a planet just because of a lucky position of it causing a bit of extra brightness. That's possible, isn't it? A large planet. So if we um, have a look at the data for each of these particular planets, if we isolate each of these exoplanets, uh, they're called TRAPPIST. I think that's the name of the satellite that, um, or related to the name of the satellite that took this data. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, relative brightness you've got here, and you can see that there's a different amount of time that each one takes to cross. 
So the one down here took longer to cross the surface of the star. That means it's farther away because it's travelling slower, farther away from the star. And if you go down here, this one took less time to cross the star. That means it's closer to the star. And that correlates, that corresponds to the fact that the purple one, labelled here 1b, uh, has a smaller period and 1h has a much higher period. So the period agrees with the duration of the, um, of the, I wouldn't say eclipse, of the occultation of the star. The occultation is what you call it when the light is blocked. So that is the transit method. We can use that to get a lot of information about, um, uh, about exoplanets orbiting stars. Uh, astrometry is measuring the precise position of a star. Now on the diagram on the right, you can see it's quite easy when there's a single exoplanet. If you are very precisely measuring the position of stars relative to other stars, and you notice that one particular star seemed to be in a, going in a little circle every few months or maybe every couple of years or something, it was position would oscillate around a certain point, you're going to go, okay, there's a big planet with a significant gravitational tug causing this uh, planet's rotation to change like this. Limitation of this method, you really do need to be looking at that solar system, that exoplanetary solar system. Um, you need to be looking at the plane of it from some position uh, perpendicular to it. Otherwise, you're not going to see this. So if you've got multiple planets, I'm just going to leave this here. You can you can enjoy that at your leisure. Maybe pause the screen or look up on Wikipedia this image. But you can see the position of the star can vary. And it can see to just wander around some average position. And that's going to be really difficult to, to unpick what's causing that. Uh, the colour changing here is just to make it easier to follow the path. That's all that's for. And people cleverer than me take that sort of data and try to create computer models to reproduce that data in order to predict what the exoplanetary system might be like. Imagine just having that curve and thinking, right, okay, let's make a solar system that matches that. And that's what they can do. Although AI is going to make that process far, far easier as we go into the future. Um, there's another method, which is the radial velocity method of detecting exoplanets. So if a star is uh, being orbited by a planet, then, as you've already seen, the star is going to gyrate. It's going to circle itself, especially if it's a very massive exoplanet reasonably close to the star. Well, if the star is moving away from us, light from that star is going to be slightly redshifted. And if the star is moving towards us, light from that star is going to be slightly blue shifted. And so by looking at the um, red and blue and red and blue and red and blue shift of the light from stars, there's a periodicity to it. And we could just take that data, the red and blue shift, shove it into a computer and see if it can identify different periodicities to identify different planets, just like we did with the light curve, but perhaps a little bit more tricky. So that's that's not really astrometry, because astrometry usually refers to measuring the position of stars. But this is um, spectroscopy, really, measuring the colours of light that have come from the stars and using redshift to determine radial velocities. Um, this is another demonstration that you can't use. Oh, they call it Doppler spectroscopy. Um, Doppler effect is... Uh, well, redshift and this is an example of the Doppler effect, or very similar to the Doppler effect. So looking here, you, you can't use uh, Doppler spectroscopy to detect redshift here, but you can here because the star's moving away, and now the star's moving towards us, now the star's moving away, and the animation pauses irritatingly. Okay, so <clears throat> oops, the final method I'm going to look at here is perhaps the most exciting one in more recent years. Uh, by more recent years, I am talking about decades now because I'm getting older and older. But let's take photographs of exoplanets. Now, usually, that's really difficult to do because the star emits so much light that it saturates the image and you can't make out any, any useful data. Uh, and there's also a lot of noise on our, on our data that we get. But you can do clever image processing to remove noise from a signal if you've got enough pictures. And... 
that's what's happened here. But also, a uh, a disk has been placed to eclipse the light, or a lot of the light, from the star to make it so that we can more easily pick out the detail of these exoplanets. And you can see there's one over here, there's one there, one there, one there. I think there's even one around here somewhere. It looks like it, perhaps. Maybe around here, some exoplanets. There's definitely one there. I think I've already identified that one. We can take photographs of them. Videos, direct imaging. That's incredible. That's incredible what we can do. So let's look at um, the next topic, which is requirements for life. So what do we need to have life? We need to have water, definitely liquid water, to move molecules, to move nutrients around, to move oxygen around, to move waste from inside to outside cells, or whatever it is alien life might have. So we need to have liquid water. Is it possible to have life with a different liquid that's not water? Well, maybe. Maybe. We, we don't know. We haven't seen any. All the life we've ever seen has liquid water uh, inside it. But then it's all earth-based. Uh, also needs to have some uh, certain um, uh, certain elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are what we use to build DNA. Uh, to make proteins, to make enzymes, which are necessary for metabolism, uh, you know, for the reproduction of cells, all this sort of thing. Uh, energy exchange. Y if you don't have uh, water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, um, oxygen, then you're not going to be able to make life based on the, all the life we've seen so far. And the last requirement for life is that it's not going to uh, come to be in the dark depths of outer space even if you've got the right ingredients if there's no energy being uh, absorbed in order for chemistry to happen it's also not going to happen if there's so much energy uh, that you know everything just boils off or you know we, we make a plasma or huge amounts of ionizing radiation stripping away molecules as soon as you try to form them and so on so we need to have a region in space where it's not so hot um, not so cold, partly so we've got liquid water, but also so that the chemistry can take place, the bio-organic chemistry, whatever it is, the biological chemistry. Yeah, the only bit of biology that science is chemistry. The only bit of chemistry that science is physics. Right, so then what else do we need? Well, I said not too much radiation, because that's going to cause uh, ionized radiation is going to cause damage to certain organic structures. Uh, and what about light? Well, I've put here not necessarily, because we've got evidence that light evolved in the Mariana Trench, where there is no light at all. And yet there is life there, right down in the Mariana Trench, that uses not light from the sun as the energy source, but heat from these vents, these geothermal vents under the sea, under the ocean as the energy source, but there's got to be an energy source. So candidates for where there might be life. What about Titan? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, it's got the right mix of organic compounds, mostly to, uh, to, to speak of. Um, it's got complex molecules, which is good. Um, what else has it got? Well, liquid water is a bit of a problem, a bit too cold for liquid water, but maybe liquid methane based life not sure what that would look like we haven't quite figured out the chemistry necessary for that yet uh, but then again it might actually be warmer deeper due to those tidal forces because of saturn given it the uh, changing the shape of titan as it orbits so maybe there's water-based life under the surface somewhere maybe it's a big maybe europa 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 orbits jupiter um and so, again, it's heated because of those tidal effects. Too far away from the sun, but it's heated by those tidal forces due to it orbiting Jupiter. That can mean, or that means that there is, we've got evidence that there's liquid water under the surface. And has it got everything we need in terms of molecules? Well, we think it probably has, maybe. It's got the same sort of levels of hydrogen and oxygen as we've got on Earth. It'd be really nice to go there and probe into the surface and see what the molecular makeup of Europa is. We're planning on doing that. What about Enceladus? Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. Again, we know that there is liquid water. We've seen evidence of liquid water. We haven't yet detected phosphorus, but we've detected loads of other 
uh, components necessary for life here. We've got simple hydrocarbons in here. We've got nitrogen because we've got ammonia on there. So there's nitrogen there. Uh, we know that there's going to be uh, silica there. So you know, there's all sorts there that's, that's positive. We know it's hot enough to cause um, these uh, tectonic activities on the surface. So there's, it's, it's hot enough possibly because of tidal forces or maybe something else in the core. But um, but we, if we detect phosphorus, that would be even more exciting. Okay, so what about outside the solar system? We were looking at life and we we're just looking inside the solar system. What about the great beyond? Well, we've been looking. And so we have found 5,307... It says here, as of the 1st of February, because that's when I first made this particular slide, so it might be more than that now, exoplanets that are within the they're terrestrial planets, which means they're sort of rocky planets, we think they're rocket planets, in a habitable zone around the star. And we'll talk about what that means in the next slide. And some they vary a lot in size. Um, nearest one, about 12 light years away, which is very exciting. 12 years for a radio signal to get there and back, but there's no evidence that there's life there yet. Um, yeah, the nearest exoplanet is 4.2 light years away, Proxima Centauri, but that doesn't orbit the habitable zone, so that doesn't meet those requirements. It's not a candidate for life. 12 light years for the nearest candidate. Um, in the, but even being in the habitable zone does, is not the only factor. So we're not just looking for planets in the habitable zone of their star. We're also looking for evidence of atmospheres with the ingredients in there. That means we have to perform spectroscopy, atmospheric spectroscopy of planets orbiting other stars. Effectively, the light from stars skims through the atmospheres of those exoplanets. We detect that light and we look at the frequencies of light that are within there. And that indicates to us where there are gaps or slightly um, lower brightness of those particular frequencies. Uh, we can correspond that to certain uh, elements and even certain molecules in some cases and see if there are the ingredients for life as well. Um, the, the good news is we have found some evidence. Australia is a, is a lovely time capsule because uh, a lot of it has been sat there, poked up above the water for a very long time, largely undisturbed. So we've seen some evidence that uh, just 400 million years after the formation of the Earth, that life may have started to form on Earth. So that's, you know, that's quite young for a planet. So even a planet that only lasts for a billion years before it's destroyed by a star, because it's a very short, uh, much shorter lived star, even then it could still have life. That means that might be life more common than we think, but it would be very primitive life um, because it takes a long time to evolve intelligence, we think. So what do we mean by habitable zone? Well, this is what we mean by habitable zone. There's this sort of uh, region. This is referred to as the optimistic habitable zone. Then we've got the conservative habitable zone. Uh, Earth and Mars are both in the habitable zone because liquid water can exist on the surface. But bear in mind, Mars does not have a dense enough atmosphere for liquid water to form on the surface. So although it's the right temperature, you'd have to have it somehow sheltered from the uh, low uh, the low density atmosphere in order to have that liquid water so mars although it's in the habitable zone the the evidence of liquid water on the surface is there but it's really salty saline really slow really slow flowing and you can see there's a bunch of planets here that sit within this region and we're looking for the atmospheres of those planets to see if any of those are suitable. And, you know, we've found a few and they always appear in the news whenever we find one. It's all very exciting. But you do need to understand these distances are so great, so vast, that it would take us hundreds of thousands of years to reach these places. And we can't even build a car that lasts 20 years, let alone a spaceship to last hundreds of thousands of years. So this is out of reach of humanity. Um... Now, the spec does ask us to cover this equation, which is an awful nonsense, to be honest with you. Uh, I sent a uh, message to the chap who uh, is really responsible 
for all of the NXL GCSE astronomy. So that's Nigel Marshall. He wrote the book, literally wrote the book on GCSE astronomy. And I said to him, well, what's your favourite outcome, answer for the Drake equation? Uh, he said, one, it must be one, because that's all we've got evidence for. And I quite liked that. So the Drake equation is supposed to predict the number of civilizations in the Milky Way uh, with which we might be able to communicate. And you calculate it by effectively multiplying together a bunch of probabilities and frequencies until you end up with a number. Now, because a lot of this is estimated, it's quite hard to get a sensible number. I would take, for example, um, these numbers here. This is from 1961, where they reckoned pff, you'd probably get about, uh, I mean, what was our, that was the average rate of star formation. They said we'd probably get one star per year forming within the galaxy. Just, just picking a number based on what they saw. They probably reckoned about a fifth of them, between a half and a fifth of them had planets. And they reckoned, you know, about one in five of those might be within the habitable zone and capable of supporting life. We now know that is very, very optimistic. Uh, you reckon, well, if it can support life, then they will develop life. They went, let's just say that if you can have life, you will get life. There's nothing special about life. If it's possible, it will happen. And then they said, and if life can happen, let's say that it will become intelligent. Again, very optimistic. And then they said, and whoa, how many of them will be able to communicate? So not just intelligent, but intelligent and become, you know, get to the point where they can send out radio signals. They reckon about 10 to 20%. I mean, where do they get these numbers from? They just made them up. Uh, and then how long will they last? You know, th these, these civilizations, somewhere between 1,000 and 100,000 years. Yeah, so that is, I mean, they, they come up with something like uh, 20 planets. But then, as you can see here, estimates ranging all the way up to 100,000 planets. It's just a lot of nonsense, really. You can pick any old numbers and come up with a number. Uh, and it would be impossible to get zero because we know of Earth. So this automatically guarantees the possibility of life, which is good because we know life can exist. But, yeah. We've got no evidence for, not a lot of evidence for these numbers that you just plug in. It's fun, but limited use. And moving on to our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So here we have the uh, search for extra extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, S-E-T-I. Back in 1977, the Big Ears Telescope in Ohio uh, was sat there pointing in the direction of Sagittarius and it detected an incredible signal. So what you've got here is a bunch of numbers. For some reason, they're being written vertically. Then you start again at the top and go down. Then you start again at the top and go down. I don't know why the printer did it that way. Uh, printing these numbers. And the way it works is one is a weak signal. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, not ten, sorry, up to nine. Uh, getting stronger. Then A, B, C, D, E, all the way up to Z. With Z being the strongest signal. Now, that doesn't mean we're getting information. So if you've ever taken a radio and tried to tune it, you might get something like Radio 4 between shows where there's about three or four seconds of silence. The radio is not receiving information. It's just getting silence. But there's a signal, a carrier signal there, organized radio waves, which is why it goes from being a hiss on your radio to suddenly getting that silence. We're transmitting nothing, but there's still a signal. Um, so digital radios rather spoil this because they don't work the same way. I'm talking about analog radios. So this is what we're looking at here with these signals. The bigger the number and letters, you know, count as numbers all the way up to Z, the stronger the signal. And they got a sudden burst of loads of strong signal lasting for 72 seconds. Here we are, look, a lot of noise, a lot of noise, a lot of noise. Bang! Signal for a long time. Now the Earth's rotating, of course. So it's as though the Earth rotated around and there was something emitting a strong signal that we just caught. We haven't been able to find it since. And we know roughly what patch of space it came from. But because of the design of the telescope, we can't pinpoint it too precisely. And this is the strongest evidence of intelligence we've got. We've tried to explain this by natural uh, natural means, we can't yet explain this. 
Um, this is a picture of the Big Ears Telescope. Uh, this picture, by the way, I've got permission to use it. It is under copyright, but I contacted the owner of the picture who gave me permission to use it as long as I... Um, you know, sent him a link to the video where it's being used. So hello, thank you for giving me permission. I very much appreciate it. This is what it looks like. So you've got a, para, a, a flat reflector here. So radio signals reflect off this flat reflector from space. Bing! They come to this parabolic reflector, which focuses them to this point here, which is your detector. And you detect a signal. And, you know, back in the 90s, or early 2000s, but back in the no late 90s, you could download a screensaver and install it on your computer, and it would download a packet of data from the SETI at Home website. It would then look for signals in it, and if it found some, which to my knowledge none of them did, but maybe it did. If it found some, it would, you know, announce it and it would send it back. Uh, but if it didn't find any, it would send back information. There's no signal in this packet of data and it would get another packet of data and analyze it. It's a sort of early form of distributed computing where computers across the world were trying to trawl through this data looking for patterns. AI can do it in a cinch now, but back then you had to distribute it to multiple computers uh, to use that processing power. Any pattern means that there might be intelligence. This is what the screensaver looked like. It was all very fancy, um, but I installed it for a bit, but didn't really do anything. So, a couple of slides left. Why should we be looking for aliens at all? Well, what are we? We're humans. We are curious. That is basically our defining feature as a species. We want to know. We've got to know. And so if that is what makes us who we are, there's no greater calling, no greater purpose for humanity than to seek knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with that. Are these people that say, oh, you know, it doesn't do anything for us. Well, you know, as a species, arts and culture and scientific knowledge is what separates us from the animals. That's what makes us special. So I think that is a very strong calling indeed. But if you do want selfish reasons, well, I love the idea of aliens giving us a stargate that we can step through and explore various planets and get resources from planets and all the rest of it. Um, you know, exploring space, as we've said several times in this video series, is just not possible to go beyond our solar system because of the huge scales involved. We don't have the physics, but maybe there's physics we haven't discovered. We're not going to be arrogant enough to say, no, that's impossible. Just, well, we haven't discovered any way of doing it yet. Maybe there is. I don't think so, but maybe there are stargates. Oh, I wish there were. Um, that's, that would be a big benefit, warp drive and all this sort of thing. What would be a danger? Well, we've seen this in science fiction as well. What happened when humans first went... Um, uh, first left uh, Africa and spread across Europe. They started hunting and killing animals for food, to skin the animals to keep them warm. Uh, and humans spread across the planet. What happened centuries later when European humans got in a boat and went across to the Americas? Oh, they found other humans there. And then they... You know, had a horrible time of it. There was war, there was disease, there was enslavement. Um, those Europeans even went back across to Africa and got some more slaves. That's what humans do. We are a horrible species. Uh, hopefully we're getting better at it, but I see enough on social media to make me think that perhaps there are still plenty of unpleasant humans out there. We go to places to steal their resources. You know, I'm using a computer right now, and I'm sad to say I'm fairly sure that the reason why I could afford this computer is because other people suffered to make it. Uh, this is the world we live in. It's a horrible, horrible world, a system of capital. Oh, no, I'm not going to go into that. Now is not the time for an anti-capitalist rant. This is us. We think we're intelligent. And what do we do? We put nets in the oceans to get fish and capture loads of dolphins. Dolphins are also intelligent, less intelligent than us. But they have feelings, they have thoughts, they want to live. What do we do? We want some uh, palm oil, so we go to the rainforest and start chopping it down to make space to grow palm oil. Orangutans have been able to communicate through sign language. They can use tools. They are intelligent. 
But their rights were less important than the rights of civilization because we wanted resources. What is to say that if an alien race did have technology that breaks all physics we understand and is able, was able to come here, that they would somehow be friendly, give us access to technology? Would you? You know, if you had a species playing in a sandbox with another species, whenever they wanted a toy that the other one had, they just punched the other kid and got the toy. Would you go, oh, here's some more toys? No, no, you wouldn't. You would not. So the any sort of extraterrestrial intelligence that may possibly maybe exist, it would have two possible outcomes. Either it would stay away from us. We're not evolved enough yet. Or it would wipe us out because it would not see any significant difference between us and orangutans and dolphins and dogs. We're not different. We're all just carbon-based life forms. And if anything, we're the worst because we're the only species actively trying to destroy our own habitat and bring about our own extinction. Well, if we're doing it to ourselves, why shouldn't aliens do it to speed the process up? But I don't believe aliens have visited Earth. And I don't believe they ever will. So I want to have that on record. And that's the end of this video. So I will endeavour to get the next one made as soon as possible. They do take a long time to make. They take a couple of hours to record, then a couple of hours to edit. And it takes many hours to make the PowerPoints. And I am a full-time teacher, but I will do my best. If you subscribe to this YouTube channel, um, then you'll get notifications when I do upload things. If you get onto the Discord server, you will... Um, and the links are probably below. Uh, you'll be able to ask questions with other like-minded people, myself and others as well will help you with that. And don't forget, I also offer weekly tuition sessions at the moment. They're on Thursdays in the evenings, uh, one for GCSE, a separate one for A-level students. All the details are on my website, physicswithkeith.com. Find all the details there or let me know. And if you liked this, do share it with other people. Spread the love. Make sure everyone gets to experience the joy of astronomy. And until the next video, thank you very much. I'll see you again.